Welcome to lecture 35. In this lecture, we'll continue to derive the equations for 2D oblique shocks. I'll talk about something called the theta-beta-m relationship, and I'll give a lot of qualitative comments. We'll do some examples in the next lecture. Here's the vector diagram plot that I sketched last time. This is a cleaner version from my fluid mechanics textbook. I'll fill in some of these angles. This is also beta, the oblique shock angle. This angle theta is the turning angle, where for flow over a 2D wedge, the oblique shock turns at angle beta, but the flow itself turns at angle theta, which for a wedge is the same as wedge half angle delta, since the flow is then parallel to the surface of the wedge. A little trig shows that this angle was beta minus theta, and therefore this angle must also be beta minus theta. One is before the shock and two is after the shock. Now we need to figure out how theta, beta, and m1 are related. The answer is an equation called the theta, beta, m relationship. I guess they couldn't come up with a more clever name. I'll derive that relationship here. From the diagram, the tangential component v1t is v1n over tangent beta. We can see that here. Similarly, V2T is V2N over tangent beta minus theta, as we see here. But as discussed last time, the tangential components V1T and V2T don't change across the shock. That is V1T equal V2T. So we equate these two equations and write our result as a ratio V1N over V2N, which turns out to be tangent beta over tangent beta minus theta. I'll call this equation 6, following my equation numbers from the previous lecture. Now recall our normal shock relations. We had rho 2 over rho 1 equal v1 over v2 equal gamma plus 1 m1 squared over 2 plus gamma minus 1 m1 squared. Now we plug in the normal component, where from last time, m1n equal m1 sine beta. So the normal component equation for our oblique shock is found by using V1n and V2n and M1n, since as we said previously, the normal component of Mach number or velocity is what changes across a shock exactly like the changes associated with a normal shock. So this equation becomes V1n over V2n equal gamma plus 1 M1n squared over 2 plus gamma minus 1 m1n squared, and then plugging this in, we get this equation, which is the ratio of the normal components of velocity across an oblique shock. I'll call this equation 7. Now we have two equations for this ratio, v1n over v2n, equation 6 and equation 7. So let's equate them, and we get this, which I'll call equation 8. This is our desired relationship between beta, theta, and m1, but we want to get it into a more useful form. This will involve some trig identities. This one many of you will remember. Cosine of 2 beta is cosine squared beta minus sine squared beta, and you probably don't remember this one. Tangent beta minus theta is tangent beta minus tangent theta over 1 plus tangent beta tangent theta. I had to look that one up myself. Of course, we have our standard identity tangent theta is sine theta over cosine theta, and cotangent beta is 1 over tangent beta. We combine all of these and do lots of algebra, which you're welcome to do on some cold rainy night when you have nothing better to do. And what we can do is isolate theta on the left side of the equation. We get tangent theta is 2 cotangent beta times m1 squared sine squared beta minus 1 over m1 squared times the quantity gamma plus cosine 2 beta plus 2. This is the famous theta beta m equation for oblique shocks. Here we're applying it at m1 because this relationship requires us to use the upstream Mach number. But it's called theta beta m, not theta beta m1. This is our workhorse equation for oblique shock analysis. I give the caveat that this is valid only for ideal gases. I'll give some comments about the theta-beta-m equation here. 
First, theta is a unique function of m and beta. So if we pick some beta and some m, remembering that this is m1, we can get theta. Explicitly, theta is the arctangent of the quantity on the right, which I duplicated here. In other words, this equation is explicit for solving for theta. By the way, I'll call this equation 9 as well, since it's really no different from our first equation 9. So from this equation, we should be able to plot theta as a function of beta and m1. And that's what most people do, and they call it the theta beta m plot, which is another clever name. Here's a procedure for how to create this plot. You pick an m1. I'll pick 1.1 as an example. Then you create a range of beta. In Excel, I pick my range as 90 degrees and decreasing in rows in Excel. We start at 90 degrees, which is the special case of a normal shock. We use equation 9 to calculate theta at each of these betas and at this m1. In Excel, I make another column and calculate these values of theta. Once I have these two columns, I plot theta versus beta at this m1. Then I repeat for other values of m1. This is how we generate the theta beta m plot. I'll sketch it here. Typically we plot theta versus beta, where theta goes from 0 to 90 degrees. And theta, the turning angle, goes from 0 to some maximum, which is approximately 45.6 degrees for air, which is the maximum possible turning angle for an oblique shock in air. This occurs at a Mach number m1 of infinity. For Mach numbers less than infinity, the curve does not rise as high. But all of these curves go to 90 degrees on the right, which represents the normal shock. This is not to scale, but these small curves down here will be Mach numbers close to 1, and the curves get larger as m1 increases. So each Mach number also has a unique minimum beta, the minimum beta represents the weakest possible oblique shock at a given Mach number m1. It's where theta equals zero, as we see here. Well, this is a Mach wave, where beta equal mu, the Mach wave angle, which is arc sine of 1 over m1. For example, at Mach number 1 equal 1.50, mu equal 41.8 degrees. So that would be this location here. Keep in mind that this plot is for air. It would look similar, but with different values and slightly different shapes for other gases. I'll make a comment here. We call this beta beta min, and it is impossible for beta to be smaller than beta min for a given m1 and gamma. Now I'll show a couple nicer f images of this figure. This is the figure from my undergraduate textbook. Recall that we use ma instead of m for Mach number, but the figure is still useful. Here's the peak theta of 45.6 degrees, and here's my 41.8 degrees for beta at Mach number 1.5. Some authors like to turn this plot 90 degrees, plotting theta horizontally and beta vertically. It's the same information, just with the axes flipped. I prefer plotting it this way, which is the way I did it in the book. Now I'll make some comments about the theta beta m plot. First, there is a unique curve for any m1 greater than 1, where you can't have a shock unless m1 is between 1 and infinity. All of these curves intersect at theta equals 0 and beta equal 90 degrees, where for a typical oblique shock, beta is the shock angle and theta is the turning angle, as discussed previously. When beta equals 90 degrees, you see that theta equals 0, because this is a normal shock. And for any Mach number between 1 and infinity, we can have a normal shock. That's why all the curves intersect at theta equals 0 and beta equal 90. This is the strongest possible shock, namely the normal shock. For a given m1, at any beta less than 90 degrees, the shock is weaker than the normal shock. So quantities like pressure jump, temperature jump, would be smaller across this oblique shock than they would be across the normal shock for the same Mach number. Beta cannot go to zero degrees unless m1 goes to infinity. This is what we showed here. The minimum beta keeps decreasing until we hit zero when Mach number goes to infinity. 
so a corollary to this comment is that beta min decreases as m1 increases. What does beta equal zero even mean? As beta gets smaller and smaller, the shock gets shallower and shallower, and at m equal infinity, the shock theoretically becomes parallel to the flow, which of course is impossible, but this is a theoretical limit. For a given m1, theta equals zero at some minimum beta, which as we already said, is equivalent to the Mach angle. This is the case of an isentropic Mach wave. The opposite extreme is that theta equals zero at beta equal 90 degrees, which is the normal shock case. For beta between mu, its minimum, and 90 degrees, theta reaches a maximum at some beta. We'll call this theta max. And furthermore, theta max increases as m1 increases. We see this in the red line on the plot where I connected points of maximum theta. Everything to the right of this red line is called a strong shock, and everything to the left is called a weak oblique shock, which we'll discuss in more detail later. Above theta max, an oblique shock cannot exist. In other words, the flow cannot turn that sharply. If this is theta max for a given Mach number, it is impossible to turn the flow any more than this. We can also say, that below beta min, an oblique shock cannot exist at the associated Mach number. Mathematically, equation nine can yield negative values of theta, but we'll ignore these since they're not possible. In other words, you can't have an oblique shock at some beta and some m1 where the flow turns at some negative theta. This is impossible. The theta beta m equation is explicit for theta, as we've already stated, Theta is unique for a given beta, m1, and gamma. Unfortunately, we usually know theta and m1 and want to predict beta. But the theta beta m equation is implicit when you want to find beta as a function of theta, m1, and gamma. So either iteration or some sophisticated software is necessary to solve for beta. To make matters worse, for a given theta, where theta is less than theta max, and Mach number m1, there are two possible betas. On our theta beta m plot, if we have a given theta and some m, suppose for example we're at 20 degrees theta and m1 is three, I get a beta there and another beta there, one to the right of theta max and one to the left of theta max. We identify these as the strong oblique shock to the right and the one to the left as the weak oblique shock which I also sketch here. Any beta to the left of theta max is a weak oblique shock, and any beta to the right of theta equal theta max is a strong oblique shock. So how do we know which one is correct? The answer is a little vague. The weak one is preferred and more common. The strong one must have very high downstream pressure to form. As I said, this answer is rather vague and not very satisfying. So we don't really know the answer unless we analyze the entire flow. Consider, for example, flow approaching some solid body. At supersonic speeds, we get a bow shock. This shock is normal right at the center line. So beta is 90 degrees or beta max at the center line. Some small distance away from the center line, beta is less than 90 degrees, but this is a strong oblique shock. And at this point, beta may become small enough to be a weak oblique shock. Depending on all the parameters in our problem, I may not have reached that point yet in this sketch. I'll discuss the details of a bow shock later in the semester. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.